Welcome back, my dear crime lovers. This is a new episode of the History of the American Mafia, brought to you for podcast by Fabio Fabiano and translated and read in English by me, Grace Cutlisi. I hope you enjoy this new episode. Today, we're going to talk about the Castellamarese War, and this is part one. There will also be a part two following shortly. The Castellamarese War is an important event in the history of the American Mafia since it coincides with the birth of a new form of organized crime that will be known as Cosa Nostra. This new organization will be American and no longer just Sicilian, but also from the regions of Campania and Calabria in the south of Italy and also include Irish and Jewish too. So in order to link the events, let me briefly recap the contents of my previous podcast that I'm sure you have already listened to. And if you haven't, please look for them on Spotify, iTunes and wherever you get your podcasts. The first Mafia family was led by Joe Morello, who was imprisoned for 10 years convicted of forgery. In 1922, Morello entrusted the command of his family to Giuseppe Massaria, known as Joe the Boss. Meanwhile, Salvatore d'Aquila was appointed head of the New York Mafia family and was killed on the 10th of October 1928. The one who was considered the mandate of the murder, Joe Massaria, with the blessing of Joe Morello, or the Artiglio as he was called, took the lead. Masseria was a despotic character and held the power of all five New York families in his hands. After becoming the undisputed leader, Masseria began lobbying other Mafia gangs, demanding a share on their rackets. He started with Tom Arena, claiming a percentage of his lucrative ice racket in the Bronx. When Arena refused, Masseria ordered his murder. So Joe the Boss and his hitmen killed Reina, shooting him to death. Masseria didn't limit himself to the city of New York, and with the same expedient, he expanded his power over the Mafia families of other cities such as Detroit and Chicago. He was also accused of being the instigator of the murder of Gaspare Milazzo in 1930, and his right hand, Sasa Parrino, in Detroit. Masseria accused Skiro of doing him wrong and expected a compensation of $10,000 from him and his resignation as head of his Mafia family. Skiro, an old man, weak and not very resolute, fearing he'd end up like Tom Marina, paid the sum and fled to Sicily. Also on Masseria's orders, on the 15th of July 1930, Vito Bonventre, one of the richest members of Skiro's group who possessed the substances to wage war, was killed near his home. Masseria appointed Joe Parrino, brother of Sassa Parrino, killed in Detroit as head of the Castellamarese family of Brooklyn. In evident contrast to Joe the boss's decisions, the men on Skiro's side appointed Salvatore Maranzano as their leader. From that moment, the conflict with Masseria and his allies began, which would be known to our days as the Castellamarese War, so defined because the line-up that opposed Joe the Boss was made up of Mafia members from Castellammare del Golfo. Masseria had the power to recruit more men and more capital against the rival gang. Maranzano, however, managed to organize his gang much better than his opponent. To give you an idea of the atmosphere in that particular moment, the leader of the Castellamarese traveled in a bulletproof limousine, accompanied by two armed vehicles, on one of which they had installed a machine gun on a rotating platform, mounted on the back boot, ready to fire at any attackers pursuing. In the early stages, there were continuous ambushes and attacks on men from the opposing sides. Salvatore Maranzano managed to recruit expert killers who were also anonymous and were deadly 
for the men of Masseria, who, not knowing them, found them a few meters away from them without having the slightest suspicion. One of these was certainly Sebastiano Domingo, also from Castellammare del Golfo, and known as the Chicago Wrecker. Already at the age of 20, when he arrived in New York, hired by Masseria, his life was deeply marked by violence. His mother had been torn apart by the explosion of a bomb placed in the car and destined for his father Tony, who was murdered two years later. Sebastiano Domingo had the deceptive appearance of a good boy, but in reality, he was a skilled marksman, especially when the machine with the machine gun. Joseph Bonanno became Maranzano's right arm. Masseria's strategic advisor, on the other hand, was the old and indomitable Joe Morello. Maranzano sensed that the brain of the organization was Morello and that in Joe Masseria was just a pompous and arrogant substitute. On August the 15th, 1930, he sent two armed men to Joe Morello and his partner Joseph Periano's office in Italian Harlem at number 352 of 116th Street. One of the hitmen was the Chicago Wrecker, or Sebastiano Domingo. The other remained unknown. The two were armed with 232 and 38 caliber revolvers. Morello, who feared no one, had no bodyguards or armed men near the office building. The two hitmen entered easily. After knocking on the apartment door, Morello naively opened the front door. Inside, the two killers found the partners, along with Periano's nephew, Gaspare Pollaro. Pollaro managed to survive just the time necessary in order to be able to report the events to the police. The two killers, once inside the apartment, started shooting madly, hitting the three to death. The confrontation at that point was at a turning point. Joe the boss had lost his best man, the inspirer of all the criminal and murderous plots of his gang. He was certain that as long as Morello, Joe the boss, was alive, he would surely win that war. In fact, some began to take sides with Maranzano by abandoning Masseria. Morello's place was taken by Alfredo Manfredi, naturalized in the United States with the name of Alfred Mineo, or Al Mineo as they called him. He was part of the family that controlled Brooklyn, previously led by Salvatore d'Aquila, and became one of the most important and powerful members. It is thought that it was Al Mineo who betrayed d'Aquila by tipping off Masseria's men, thus to become the new boss of the family and left Maranzano to ally with Masseria. Steve Ferrigno was appointed as his deputy. Other criminal names associated with them were Carlo Gambino, Frank Scalice, Vincent Mangano, Joe Biondo and Joseph Ricobono. Affiliates numbered to about 300 and were all involved in alcohol smuggling, gambling, extortion, usury, clandestine union lotteries and illicit harbour businesses across Brooklyn. With Masseria's permission, the clan also expanded to Manhattan, starting the faction that will later be known to, until today as the very powerful Gambino family. Al Mineo, once appointed to replace the crafty Joe Morello, didn't turn out to be up to the task. He proved to have no strategy and his only interest was to find Maranzano's hiding place and kill him. Maranzano, however, was actually much more cunning. In fact, on November the 5th, 1930, Maranzano heard of a meeting that had been organized by Joe Masseria with his men, including Al Mineo and Steve Ferrigno, Joe Catania, Lucky Luciano, and Vito Genovese. The Castellamarese had his men placed in an apartment opposite the one where the meeting had taken place in the Bronx. 
As Masseria's men left, they found themselves under fire from Maranzano's hitmen. Mineo and Ferrigno were murdered, while Masseria and his men miraculously came out unscathed. Maranzano's killers were thought to be Joe Bonanno, Nick Capizzi, Gaspari Di Gregorio, John Bonventre and Sebastiano Domingo, better known as the Chicago Destroyer. Frank Scalice became the new head of the Bronx family, who ended up secretly allying with Maranzano without Masseria's knowledge, playing both sides.